Hello! In this video, we will be reviewing the development of the follicle, the egg, and the endometrial lining during the female menstrual cycle. I've already drawn the skeleton of the picture. We're going to be basically filling in vocabulary and talking through the hormones. Uh, this is essentially a quiz of what we did in class, so when I ask you a question, you should pause and try to answer it yourself. So let's put this into perspective, what's happening here. In the first column, we have what we see before birth. Okay, The development of the egg and follicle before birth basically stops until puberty begins at this point. So, so what we have at birth basically is what women will have for the 12 to 16 years before they start a menstrual cycle. Then the menstrual cycle, which occurs approximately 350 times in one's lifetime, occurs over a, on average, 28-day period. Of course, that can vary. There are days 1 to 14. Then there's day 14, during which ovulation occurs. What is ovulation by definition? It is release of the egg into the fallopian tube. So that's the egg that will have a chance to be fertilized. And that chance lasts about 12 to 24 to 48 hours. And then we have the phase from 15, day 15 to 28, and then we start over approximately 350 times. Days 1 to 14 are associated with what phase? What's the name of the phase from 1 to 14? It is called the follicular phase, and it is referring to the time when the follicle is in the ovary. What is day 15 to 28 called? The luteal phase, lasting from day 15 to 28. Again, hopefully you're pausing and trying to answer these questions yourself to see what you know and what you don't know. That's how you figure out how ready you are. Okay, So we're going to go through step by step because there's a lot going on here and we're going to start with the egg. Okay, This egg right here is the germ cell egg. What do we call the female germ cell. We call it the oogonium or oogonium. Is it diploid or haploid? It is diploid. It is a germ cell, meaning it is the precursor cell that might become a sex cell. So it is diploid like all the other cells of the body. It hasn't gone through meiosis yet. And in fact, the meiosis phases won't end until the menstrual cycle. All of these cells, all the oogonium, will transition into cells that will be determined to become sex cells. What do we call the next stage after oogonia? These are called the primary oocytes. So by the time a female is born, in her ovary, 100% of the cells that survived will be primary oocytes. 
are primary oocytes, diploid, or haploid. They are diploid. Notice that this is not a meiosis step. This is what's called a differentiation step. The oogonium starts expressing different genes, getting the cell ready for meiosis. And at that point, it's, an, it's a cell that's definitely going to become a sex cell. It is a primary oocyte. Okay? From birth, before birth, until puberty starts, in one's ovary will be primary oocytes. Okay? When the menstrual cycle begins, we're going to have about 5 to 10 of those primary oocytes compete to be the cell that will be ovulated. Okay. So every month, out of that pool of primary oocytes, about 5 to 10 cells will undergo meiosis 1. At that point, what is the next cell in the cycle going to be called? After meiosis 1, this is a secondary oocyte. So of, remember, there's this pool of primary oocytes. 5 to 10 are going to compete. And we're going to get these secondary oocytes. Notice something. In the sperm, during spermatogenesis, the two cells were equally sized at the end of meiosis 1. But look, here we have one giant cell and one baby cell. What basically happens is for these sister cells, the dominant cell will steal all the cytoplasm and become even bigger and basically kill her sister. Okay, What do we call the tiny sister? We call her a polar body or it a polar body. Are these cells at the end of meiosis 1 diploid or haploid? They are haploid with their copies. So they still have their copies. It'll take meiosis 2 to get rid of those. So this arrow right here What is that arrow symbolizing? What would I write on that arrow? I would write one cell ovulated. Due to the complicate due to a complicated process, only one of those 5 to 10 competing cells will be ovulated, the winner. The winner will basically kill all the other cells. Remember, this is the same cell that stole all the cytoplasm from her sister. It's not a particularly uh, sharing cell. So this cell is the winner, and the secondary oocyte is ovulated. The winner is ovulated. Notice I didn't write meiosis 2. Why not? When and only when will meiosis 2 happen? So notice I have two branches if fertilization happens and no fertilization happens. In the female reproductive cycle, two different things happen depending on whether fertilization takes place or not. If it's no fertilization, you don't need this egg, the egg degenerates. And next month you'll do it again. But if it is fertilization, only after fertilization will you get meiosis 2. Okay? So here we have a haploid secondary oocyte. So this cell where I wrote secondary oocyte in the follicular phase, that's the same cell as this one. What do we call the sperm that fertilizes the egg?
That sperm is called a spermatozoa, produced via spermato and spermiogenesis from the previous lecture or video. When, oh, I'm sorry, is this spermatozoa haploid or diploid? It's haploid. It has to be. Why? Because when the secondary oocyte and the spermatozoa combine, it will initiate meiosis too. After that, the secondary oocyte loses its copies, and we have haploid chromosomes and haploid chromosomes. As they combine together, a haploid plus a haploid equals a what? A diploid. Now we have a zygote which will eventually become a human being filled with diploid cells. So you're diploid, I'm diploid, all your classmates are diploid. If we want to produce offspring we can't give them a diploid cell because if we give a diploid and the other parent gives a diploid all of a sudden there's four chromosomes. It's too many. It, that's not viable. It won't live. We have to somehow have a system to make our offspring diploid. So we, what we do is we have our diploid cell. The other parent halves their diploid cell. We combine those haploids and then we make a unique diploid individual. The egg does not develop alone. The development of the oocyte as it develops requires the follicle, which is colored in green. What is the name of this oh what is the name of these cells inside of the follicle? They are called granulosa cells. Notice before birth there's only one layer of gro uh, granulosa cells. What do we call the follicle made up of one layer of granulosa cells? This is called the primordial follicle. Up until puberty begins, you only have a primordial follicle. When puberty begins, just like five to ten eggs undergo meiosis, the, the follicles that actually surround the egg also begin maturing for those five to ten cells. Okay, so, so at the same time the egg is maturing, those five to ten eggs are maturing, at that same time the follicles around them will be maturing. So what's the name of the follicle that comes after the primordial follicle? It's called the primary follicle. Next comes the secondary follicle. And what do we call a mature follicle? We call that a graphene follicle which I've drawn for us. I've color coded the important parts. First things first, as I said, the follicle surrounds the egg. So in this picture, this secondary oocyte is actually located here. I drew it separately up top, but it's really surrounded by the graphene follicle at this point. So why are we having all of these maturation steps? Why do we go from primary to secondary to graphene follicle? What's happening this whole time, as we get through here, is going to be an increase in follicular cells. What hormone do the follicular granulosa cells make?
they make estrogen. So the more cells we have, each of these follicles is progressively bigger. So primary, secondary, graphene follicle get progressively bigger. More cells equals increased estrogen release. That'll be important to us later. Okay, so I pointed out where the egg is. Notice it's surrounded by this blue glycoprotein layer. What do you call that blue glycoprotein layer? It's called the zona pulicida, and it is necessary for proper fertilization. In green, you have the corona radiata. The zona pellucida and the corona radiata are released with the egg during ovulation. So if I were to draw that, here's our ovulated egg up top. Our ovulated egg would actually be released with the zona pellucida and the corona radiata around it. That means a spermatozoa would have to get through all of these layers to reach the oocyte's plasma membrane. So these layers will both nurture the egg and protect the egg with more layers so only the best sperm can reach it. In fact, when we talk about the acrosomal cap on the sperm, you'll see the enzymes in the acrosomal cap are necessary to get through all of these protective layers of the egg. So that's what's ovulated with the egg. What stays in the ovary, so, so everything that I drew up here will be in the fallopian tube where fertilization takes place. But what I've drawn in red stays in the ovary. What do we call the structure in red after ovulation that's left over? It's called the corpus luteum. What hormone does it primarily release? It primarily releases progesterone with some estrogen. Most important to us will be the high progesterone. So the corpus luteum releases high progesterone. Okay, Progesterone is necessary to maintain a pregnancy. So again, we have this question of whether pregnancy takes place or not. If it doesn't, the corpus luteum will degenerate. If it does, corpus luteum is maintained through the first trimester of pregnancy. The corpus luteum's ho hormone release of progesterone will be necessary to maintain pregnancy through the first trimester. After that, the placenta will take over. So we've concluded the egg and the follicle. Next thing we need to talk about the hormones. I've drawn uh, two hormonal uh, gr uh, graphs of two hormones in purple and orange. Which one's LH and which one's FSH? In purple is FSH and in orange is LH. How do you know that? Because LH surges around the time of ovulation. So, which hormone is most important during the follicular phase, FSH or LH? That answer is FSH. What does FSH stand for? Follicle stimulating hormone. So what do you think it does? It 
it increases follicular growth. So it makes sense it would be the hormone most important to the follicular phase. What happens next? The follicle increases in cellular number, which means we release more estrogen. Once we get to the graphene follicle, we'll have a significant amount of estrogen released. And estrogen in high numbers has a positive feedback effect on LH and FSH release. What does that mean? If it has a positive feedback effect, when estrogen release is increased, what will happen to LH and FSH release? It will increase as well. That's what positive feedback means. Instead of trying to get the estrogen levels down, okay, we're going to increase the levels of estrogen through positive feedback. What will matter most to us is this big surge in LH called the LH surge, which happens here, slightly before ovulation. What two effects does the LH surge have? The first, notice it happens slightly before ovulation. The LH surge actually directly stimulates ovulation. The other thing, what does LH stand for? It stands for luteinizing hormone. It stimulates formation of the corpus luteum. So LH will do two things. First, it'll start ovulation, and it'll then start the luteal phase by producing the corpus luteum, which brings us to step five. Once we have the corpus luteum, we increase progesterone release. Progesterone has a negative feedback effect on FSH and LH. So if we increase progesterone, what will happen to FSH and LH levels? they will be decreased. And that is why, one second, negative feedback. If we increase progesterone, we have negative feedback on LH and FSH. That's why the amount of FSH and LH in the luteal phase is less than in the follicular phase because of that negative feedback by progesterone. If pregnancy takes place, progesterone levels will stay high, FSH levels will stay low, and there will not be any more follicles stimulated to grow. In contrast, if there's no fertilization, then the corpus luteum will degenerate. What will happen to progesterone levels? They will go down. Without progesterone, we lose negative feedback. What happens to FSH and LH levels? They increase, and that brings us back to step one. And now we're going to have another menstrual cycle. Because progesterone is lost, FSH levels go up, the follicle grows, estrogen is released, positive feedback, LH surge, and we'll have ovulation. So if there's no fertilization, we'll start this over again. If there is fertilization and the progesterone levels stay high, we'll never get back to this step one because the FSH levels will stay low because of the negative feedback. So the final thing we need to talk about in relation to all of this is the endometrial lining. The endometrial lining will have its own phases. Okay? I'm going to start here. And I'll be describing these for you. And you'll see that they're dependent significantly on the hormones that are released. What I have here is the thickness of the endometrial lining in black. 
and the blood vessels in red. Okay? So, this part here is dependent on estrogen. Increase in estrogen because the follicle is growing. That increase in estrogen will cause mitosis. The cells will grow, the blood vessels will grow. What do we call this phase of the uh, uterine lining? We call this the proliferative phase. More cells, pro-life. The proliferative phase that lasts from days 5 to 14 because that's when the estrogen levels come second to the progesterone levels from day 14 ish to 28 okay at this time we'll have an increase in progesterone and it's not that we'll get more cells the cells will get bigger they enlarge that's called hypertrophy they get bigger and start secreting chemicals. The chemicals that they start secreting are chemicals that are going to help the zygote implant in the appropriate place in the uterus. So basically this endometrial tissue is going to start secreting chemicals that are saying come here, implant here, this is where you want to be for the next nine-ish months. Okay, So that's what this phase is called. I'm sorry, this is what is, this phase is for. What is this phase called? It is called the secretory phase, and it lasts from days 14 to 28. Why 14 to 28? Well, roughly. Well, what happens is, the proliferative phase which is dependent on estrogen and the secretory phase was dependent on progesterone. By day 28 at the end we're going to be low on progesterone and low on estrogen because there's no follicle and there's no corpus luteum. Okay, So at day 28 there is no follicle to make estrogen and there's no corpus luteum to make progesterone which means that we're low on both. The uterine lining needs estrogen and progesterone to survive. When progesterone and estrogen levels get low, the blood vessels will constrict. Because they constrict, we will not be able to get oxygen to the tissues of the endometrial lining. The endometrial lining will die. Contractions will slough off or release that endometrial lining, at which point we get if we go back to day one, the menstrual phase from approximately day one to five. The menstrual phase continues until we've released all of last month's uterine endometrial lining, at which point the follicle will start producing estrogen again and enough estrogen to restart the proliferative phase.